Parasite Eve is a game that I'd heard of but never really knew much about for the longest time. All I really knew was that it was another RPG developed by Square in the late 90s, you know, one of like 5,000. After it was suggested to me a number of times in response to my Legend of Dragoon retrospective though, I finally decided to look a bit more into it and I found a fascinating story of a game that might be the very first of its kind. Not only is this 1998 PlayStation game Square's first M-rated title, Parasite Eve was the first time that a Square game's development took place concurrently both in Japan and in the United States, and it was the first time that Square delved at least a bit into the survival horror genre, often drawing comparisons to gaming's king of terror at the time, Resident Evil. But more interesting than all of that is that as far as I've been able to find, Parasite Eve is the very first video game that's a direct sequel to a novel, a 1995 horror novel with the same name that didn't release outside Japan until seven years after the game's release. It's just, I've, I've never heard of anything quite like this game, and the more that I've dug into it, the more interesting the story behind Parasite Eve became. But even better than a neat history, it's also just a really fun game with interesting characters and a solid but also kind of hilarious story. It's a game that I've fallen for pretty hard, and a game that I think many of you will fall in love with too, if you haven't already over the last 20 years. So without further ado, this is Parasite Eve. Like many of Square's sleeper hits during the PS1 era, much of Parasite Eve's DNA is taken from the cutting room floor of Final Fantasy VII. Back when that game was still in development for the Super Nintendo, producer Hironobu Sakaguchi had plans to set FF7 in New York City, with the game's plot at one point following a detective that was chasing what would become the main cast. In Parasite Eve, you play as NYPD detective Aya Brea, who chases the villain back and forth through the Big Apple with her fellow officers. Whether that detective overlap is intentionally taken from the initial Final Fantasy VII concept or just some happy coincidence, I can't really say. But since we don't have a ton of info about this game's development, I'm going to infer that the pieces just sort of fell together once Square obtained the rights to develop a game based on the incredibly popular Parasite Eve novel. Due to the Parasite Eve licensing agreement going through the book's publisher and not him directly, writer Hideaki Sena had no input on where the game's plot might go. In fact, he had no idea what the plot would even be until it was done. But despite all of this, the game ended up pleasantly surprising him as a faithful sequel that, by coincidence, was also able to incorporate some of the development team's cut Final Fantasy VII ideas. I guess that's just kind of what happens when your game's lead writer and director was one of the leads on games like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy IV. Things just kind of happen to work out for you. Whatever the sequence of events may have been, we ultimately ended up with what I would say is the best of both worlds here. A detective Final Fantasy game may have been a hard sell at the time, but a detective science fiction buddy cop semi-horror RPG as its own thing works far better, as weird as all of those words might sound when together in harmony. And speaking of harmony, we'll be talking about music quite a bit with this game, both because Parasite Eve was the breakout performance for the now legendary Kingdom Hearts composer Yoko Shimomura, and because the game focuses in on a music theme even as early as its intro. The game takes place over the course of six days from Christmas Eve to December 29th, 1997, as Aya and the NYPD rush to stop super-powered mitochondria from revolting against every cell in every human's body. You know what? Maybe I should start from the top. We open with Aya entering New York's famous Carnegie Hall, attending an opera that she doesn't seem all that into with a date that she doesn't seem all that into. Near the climax of the show, the female lead's eyes begin to glow as she's singing, and everybody in Carnegie Hall spontaneously combusts and burns to death. Everybody, that is, except for Aya. Well, and her date who scurries off in terror before he can be burned to a crisp, never to be seen again. Aya confronts the singer on stage, where the woman claims that her name is Eve, and she unlocks some sort of latent power in Aya. And this is where we get our first taste of this game's very unique combat style. Parasite Eve incorporates a modified active time battle system like many Square games at the time, but unlike most of those games, these fights take place in a traversable battlefield, with players able to move around a small section of the level to avoid enemies and get into position for attacks. When the ATB meter is full and you choose to attack, this wire grid sphere will overlay onto the battlefield, showing Aya's attack range for her equipped weapon. 
Naturally, if an enemy is close to or beyond the range of Aya's attack radius, it's pretty likely that she'll either miss the hit entirely or deal absolutely pitiful damage. And I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty funny seeing this trained officer with the accuracy of a stormtrooper from more than about 10 feet away. This also means that likewise, if you're right up next to an enemy when you fire a shot, it's much more likely to deal a critical hit. It's a simple but engaging system, letting skilled players read and dodge enemy attacks and customize their playstyle based on their preferred weapons and ranges. During this first encounter with Eve, Aya also unlocks her Parasite Energy Meter, also known as PE. This is essentially your mana or magic meter from any other RPG, allowing you to heal or dispel a status effect without using an item or, later on, use some special attacks. After this first fight, Eve escapes and Aya pursues her through the backstage area, stepping over the charred remains of other performers and patrons and witnessing rats and birds transforming into these grotesque monsters. Thanks to the final words of one of these performers and thanks to a diary she finds backstage, Aya puts together that Eve is actually a woman named Melissa who's been feeling sick for weeks. Melissa hadn't seen a doctor yet out of fear of getting pulled from this lead role, so instead she accidentally overdosed on her prescribed medication hoping to make it through. Huh, somebody hiding that they're sick for selfish reasons, man, that's timeless. When Aya corners Eve in the backstage rehearsal room, the real, terrified Melissa very briefly peeks through before Eve takes complete control of her body, transforming into this floating demon thing and attacking Aya for the real first boss fight. You might be wondering right about now why floating demon things and magic exist in what's supposed to be a relatively grounded game set in real-world New York. Well, it's not magic, it's mitochondria, which you may recall is the powerhouse of the cell. Now, I'm not gonna give a biology lesson here, but the science in Parasite Eve's science fiction references the amazing power of mitochondria, the microscopic organelle present in most of your body's cells that's responsible for energy conversion. Without mitochondria, plants, animals, and essentially every complex cell that has a nucleus just wouldn't be able to exist as we know it. The fiction in Parasite Eve's science fiction imagines a world where mitochondria are actually their own evolved organism, living inside and fueling other species like humans for their own eventual gain, also known as a parasite. The author of the original Parasite Eve novel, Hideaki Sena, came up with the idea for this book's plot while studying the effects of different pharmaceutical drugs on mitochondria and energy conversion. What if the very basis for our existence was turned against us, and what if all the stored energy in the human body suddenly activated all at once? Human explosions, apparently. Look, I'm not gonna think about it too much. Both the game and the novel preceding it have a good enough grasp on the science side of things that it's easy enough to suspend your disbelief and just kinda roll with the fiction. All I know is that I chuckled every time a character spoke about taking over the nucleus or harnessing the power of mitochondria. It may be played seriously, but when you're fighting giant mutated sewer crocodiles, it's just, it's so campy and I love it. Over the course of the next few days, Aya and her fellow NYPD officers, namely her partner Daniel, attempt to track down Eve and put a stop to her mitochondrial manipulation. In doing so, they visit surprisingly faithful renditions of Central Park, the American Museum of Natural History, St. Francis Hospital, and a few other areas throughout Manhattan. This is one of the highlights of Parasite Eve's New York to me. It didn't just emulate the city's exterior landscape and throw you out into the streets. In fact, only a few areas of this game are even outside at all. Instead, Square attempts to capture the look and feel of several distinct interiors, ensuring that each day feels like its own unique chapter, even if most of the six chapters are only about 50 minutes in length. In probably the most recreated city in video game history, we always explore the outside, but this game gives us the rare chance to actually look at the beating heart underneath it all. This is a huge part of what makes Parasite Eve's intro stand out from its contemporaries, you know, flaming bodies aside. I can't think of many games that start you out in a place like Carnegie Hall, let alone a rendition so lovingly reimagined from the real thing, and let alone inside Carnegie Hall itself. It's just such a distinct first impression from any other PS1 game I can think of. Of course, I'm sure that this game's rendition of something like the Museum of Natural History isn't one-to-one -to, -one to the real thing's floor plan, but it's also been over two decades since Square staffers probably visited the museum in real life, and it's not like I can go on a field trip to check that right now anyway, you know. If Parasite Eve has a home base of sorts, it would definitely be Aya's NYPD office, where she regroups frequently with her partner Daniel as well as some of the other officers, such as her boss Captain Baker or the duo in the weapons locker that are constantly bickering about gun safety. 
This office is the setting where we open up on day two, Christmas Day, and it's the first area of the game where I really noticed Parasite Eve's excellent atmosphere. Although the plot may not end up making a ton of use of the whole detective angle directly, our base of operations here does a lot of legwork to keep us grounded and remind us of Aya's career. From the messy upper offices jammed full of overstuffed casework cabinets, to the small talk dialogue from the front desk clerk, to the dimly lit captain's office, the clacking of keyboards as background noise, and even the eerie silence of parts of the bottom floor, it all does a great job of putting you into that detective mindset. As the only witness to, and the sole survivor of the Carnegie Hall incident, you know, minus her date, who, I'm serious, is never mentioned again, like, this isn't some joke or anything, it's not foreshadowing, he's gone forever, and he's never coming back, Aya is considered a top suspect by the media, even though the officers know that she's innocent. So, naturally, during a press conference intended to suppress panic, she speaks up against her captain's orders and causes panic. You know, as you do. After that press conference very, very clearly went well, we get to see one of my favorite recurring bits in Parasite Eve. When traveling between parts of the city, Aya and Daniel will often have a quick conversation about the case, and it's these car talks where we get some of the most character out of Daniel especially. Since nobody except for Aya can enter areas where Eve currently is, thanks to the whole, you know, bursting into flames thing, a good half of our adventure involves our protagonist being completely isolated. So to have this sort of brief or debrief situation happening in a car ride helps ground the player just that little bit more, reminding you again that although you've been alone, you've still had people on your side ready to help however possible. And moments like these, like being in the NYPD office or seeing Daniel talk with his son Ben, they all bring you back to the human side of this story. Plus, I just love the aesthetic of these scenes. It's nothing remarkable by modern standards, but seeing the buildings reflecting in the cruiser's windshield as the duo speeds through Manhattan just sells the big city atmosphere even more. Plus, it does a pretty great job at masking the fact that Parasite Eve only has about half a dozen locations that you can go to on the city map. After they investigate the standoffish mitochondria researcher Dr. Clamp, Aya and Daniel find out that a huge crowd is gathering in Central Park for another concert, a concert at which Melissa slash Eve was slated to perform, and a concert which Daniel's son and ex-wife were attending. Central Park, on top of being the first proper dungeon in this game, is the first place where we get a better taste of its RPG side. Since fights take place in real time exactly where the encounters start, you'll begin to get an idea of when to expect fights based entirely on the rooms or corridors that you're in. There aren't exactly any random encounters, at least from what I've experienced. When you cross through one of the possible fight areas, there's instead a random chance that you'll enter an encounter, but even these felt more or less locked in. I would run into a fight in just about every instance if I had to backtrack to find an item that I missed, like, say, this mandatory key that's hidden in a drawer that I tried interacting with about 20 minutes prior. Maybe I wasn't close enough or in the exact right spot, I don't know, at the end of the day this still is a PS1 game, so there'll be moments like that, and thankfully this was more or less the last time that I ran into one of those problems. Either way, I had spent about 20 minutes slowly moseying through different parts of Central Park, getting into fights, and trying to see if I'd missed a room or a chest with a key or something like that. When I say moseying, by the way, I mean it. Aya moves with no purpose whatsoever. You've just gotta deal with her slow run speed and doofy PS1 walk the entire time, and don't even get me started on the ladder animations. For the record here, this is... this is entirely unskippable. I'm... I'm not controlling any of this. Even if you do get used to the slow movement speed after about an hour or so, it's gonna come back and remind you during backtracking like this. And like I would later find is essentially the rule with Parasite Eve, if a room features an encounter, you can expect to deal with a fight every time you mosey into that room. That's even if you escape the fight for the record. The escape button is essentially worthless here because the moment you try and walk in that direction again, the very same encounter will pop right back up. That's the cost of this game's linearity, but it's not a huge price to pay at least. Fights don't often take all that long, but they always dole out a pretty good experience payout. And just as important as the experience, the fights give you a good chance to test out the different weapons and gear that Aya will obtain and figure out your particular playstyle. On top of each weapon's base stats, every weapon has a different clip size and its own fire rate that determines how many shots you can pop off in one single attack. 
While the ammo clip part of that isn't usually that big of a deal, if you run out of ammo in mid-attack, Aya will stop, stand still, reload, and then fire off the remaining bullets. This leaves you completely vulnerable while she's reloading and could turn out to be a very dangerous situation, especially if enemies hit you since they'll usually stun you for an extra moment. Thankfully, this mostly turns out to be more of a nuisance than anything else. And although up until now some of this may just sound like par for the course, some weapons in this game have bonus effects like turning bullets into tranquilizer darts at the cost of some damage, or adding a freeze effect, and many others. Likewise, different armors will have their own bonuses too, like a chess piece that will automatically use a healing item when your health drops too low. As you play, you'll find a whole load of weapons that can add bonus points to specific weapon or armor stats as well, but coolest of all is that with the modding tools that you'll find in chests, hidden areas, or even by stealing items from enemies, you can transplant these bonus stats and or the secondary effects from one piece of gear to another. This means that you can have a grenade launcher that fires 5 shots per ATB meter instead of 1, or you can boost your range so that essentially the entire fight field is always in Aya's sight. At points throughout the game, you'll obtain mod passes that let you add an extra effect slot to your gear too, so if you really wanted to rock the same gun the whole way through and just keep frankensteining it with new bonuses and upgrades, that's absolutely doable. Between the weapon modification system and the dozen or so different PE slash magic attacks and buffs or debuffs, whatever you want to call any of them, the gameplay is entirely malleable to your own tastes. In my example, I rarely even used moves like haste during my first playthrough, and I had no idea that I could expand my inventory until later on in the game, so I often just used my heal spell rather than wasting my precious items. This altogether adds a ton of extra replayability to what would otherwise be a mostly one-and-done, again, linear experience. It's because of things like Parasite Eve's weapon system, its fixed cinematic camera angles, its survival horror sort of approach, its story about a city's police force fighting against supernatural beings, and of course the era in which this game released, that it often drew comparisons to Resident Evil. Comparisons that seem to hold even decades later. And for whatever it's worth, as somebody who chose to address those comparisons in this video's branding, I don't think the two are actually all that similar. I think that journalists in the 90s just really liked comparing things to other more popular things, like how every FPS was a Doom clone for most of the decade until they all became Halo killers a few years later. Now don't get me wrong, I'd be shocked if Parasite Eve didn't take at least a little bit of inspiration from Biohazard, but outside of the fact that the games deal with some similar concepts, that Parasite Eve has you saved by using a phone similarly to how classic Resident Evil used typewriters, and that the games both have a wide arsenal of guns but a very limited supply of ammo, the comparison just doesn't really hold to me, at least for this game, but we'll come back to that later on. The reason I mention Resident Evil here is because some of the things that I never cared for in those games, Parasite Eve actually addresses really well. For example, remember that key I mentioned a moment ago? Well, keys, just like every other item, take up space in your very limited inventory. I know that rings a bell to Resident Evil fans. And you're going to get a lot of keys in every chapter. Thankfully, sometimes once an item's no longer useful, Aya will just chuck it, but for most regular keys, they're going to eat at your space forever unless you remember to chuck it in storage when you're back at the police department. But what if you're already in the thick of a dungeon when you're low on space? You could drop an item, but you might need that item later. What if you drop that extra weapon or armor piece now, but then later on you find a tool that'll allow you to swap its stats over to your equipped gear? While every weapon except for rockets conveniently uses the same ammo, and all ammo is conveniently stored in one big box that only takes one space up in your inventory, you may not want to enter an area with fewer than two or three guns just in case the situation calls for a different strategy, and two or three guns might be 10% or more of your total carrying capacity. Parasite Eve's solution for item hoarders like me is that as you level up, your inventory size will increase as if it's one of your stats, allowing your gear and your options to expand as you get stronger. And my favorite part of this game's RPG mechanics enhances this even more. Whenever you level up, you'll earn bonus points that pool up in a separate meter. You can spend these points to increase a weapon or armor stats just like regular bonus points, or you can use these to either speed up your ATB gauge's fill speed or increase your carrying capacity even more. So if you'd rather use a heavier weapon like a grenade launcher, you can offset its slower charging speed by boosting your ATB stat early on. 
since you can only perform one single action per ATB charge, whether that's an attack, spell, item use, or weapon or armor change, I recommend at least spending some points this way to limit your risk of being overwhelmed by enemies faster than you can react. But on the other hand, if you're a player that wants a lot of extra space so that you can carry a ton of revives or health items, and by the way, if you have that auto heal armor on so that you don't waste turns healing, you're gonna burn through those items pretty quickly, you can do that instead. It's entirely up to you. Anyway, let's get back on track here. Once Aya conquers the boss of finding this one dumb key sitting right in front of her, she makes her way to the concert hall to try and stop Eve from setting a thousand more people on fire, including little Ben. And, uh, technically mission accomplished, because right when she gets there, Eve turns everybody else in attendance into brown mitochondrial goo. I don't know about you, but if I sat down for a nice Christmas Day show at Central Park, and I saw a giant floating demon lady with a big bee stinger under her, I, I'd be getting the fuck out of there right away. Actually, now that I think about it, this is New York we're talking about. That might just be normal on the subway there. While Aya chases Eve down and fights her while riding a flaming chariot, and by flaming chariot, I mean the horse is on fire, this game is just amazing, Daniel finds his son Ben, who left the show around the time that he saw the floating demon lady. Thank you, somebody else gets it. However, the young boy's mom, Daniel's ex-wife, stayed, and now is one with the goo. One, one with the, with the goop. With with the, with the poo goo. With a thousand people dead in only the previous 24 hours and no end in sight, maybe I shouldn't have said poo goo a moment ago, that kind of takes away from the mood a bit, the city undergoes a complete evacuation, leaving only essential personnel such as the police force behind to try and deal with Eve. Putting aside the fact that there is no way New York City was evacuated in the span of like eight hours, this cinematic might be the strongest in the entire game. For as much as I may have laughed at the mere mention of mitochondria up until now, everything starts to get real over just a few short minutes. There's something about seeing the city that never sleeps in utter silence that shakes your core a little bit. It, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel real. And yet, here we are. Even what had been your home base, your safe house in this crazy couple hours of game up until now, the NYPD office, leaves you uneasy after this point. Daniel leaves his son with one of the K-9 officers to go look for the missing and unconscious Aya, and that officer lets him play with one of the friendly police dogs. In a game where every animal or creature that we've seen has morphed into some untamable beast, you already know where this is going, and yet there's nothing you can do to stop it. Having passed out during the fight with Eve, Aya wakes up in an abandoned apartment building in Soho with Daniel and a stranger watching over her. This is where the Parasite Eve book starts to come back into play. This younger man is a Japanese scientist named Kunihiko Maida, and he flew across the globe to New York the moment he heard about the fireworks at Carnegie Hall. Maida explains that a nearly identical incident had happened in Japan years prior, which had driven him to study mitochondria. That first incident is Parasite Eve, the original novel. As Maida describes the book's events, a scientist tried cultivating the liver cells of his brain-dead wife in order to somehow bring her back after she'd gotten into a car accident. The wife's cells by chance contained the advanced sentient mitochondria known now as Eve, and Eve used this opportunity to try and breed the ultimate life form. By taking over the body of a different woman who'd received the wife's donated kidney, and by combining her cells with the scientist's, um, Let's, let's, we'll call it donated sperm. It's not really donated, but you know what, let's keep it PG-13 as much as we can here. Eve could ensure that a baby would be born that could change its own genetic code as it saw fit on the fly. This first attempt by Eve failed, however, because the scientists, <clears throat> DNA revolted against the takeover, and Eve, the baby, and the scientist all died in the ensuing conflict. But that young woman who received the transplant? She survived, superpowered kidney and all, and it's very strongly implied that she later moved to the US, settled down, and gave birth to Aya. Like I said earlier, this plot tie-in here makes Parasite Eve, as far as I know, the first video game that's a direct sequel to a novel. Now, of course, other games had been adapted from novels far, far earlier, such as Dune or stuff like the many Sherlock Holmes games. And I'm almost certain there's gotta be at least one fringe case of a game that's a canonical sequel to a book that I haven't been able to find from like the, the late 70s, early 80s time frame. So if you know one, make sure to let me know. Either way, Parasite Eve is a special case in that it's an author-approved sequel that the author had no hand in producing. 
Although the novel's creator Hideaki Sena had no idea what the plot would even be for this game, once it released, he appreciated this Parasite Eve's continuation of his Parasite Eve, and he apparently liked it far more than he liked the Japanese Parasite Eve movie adaptation at least. I don't know, I just find the whole environment surrounding this game's development fascinating, especially considering it's a game that's been a bit left behind compared to other horror-focused contemporaries like Silent Hill and Resident Evil. This was Square in what many would call the studio's peak form, with a super group of developers firing on all cylinders to push their more cinematic vision of gaming's future. I mean, the game's only about 8 hours long, and yet it spans two full discs solely due to the abundance of at-the-time high-quality FMV cutscenes. Parasite Eve was the company's marquee 1998 title in the United States, essentially their first heavily marketed post-Final Fantasy VII title, and yet it wasn't even their own intellectual property. And despite the game being a sequel to a book that half of the game's buyers didn't or for a long time couldn't read, it's entirely absorbable within just the context of the game. It's a game that in many ways could only happen in this particular era, and Parasite Eve somehow despite that also avoids many of the PS1 era's biggest pitfalls. For example, those FMV cutscenes. Yes, they may look a little bit rough now, but since so many of the cinematics focus on locations and objects, or on grotesque monsters rather than human character models, they hold up at least a good bit better than contemporaries do. That opening cinematic teasing the Statue of Liberty with what looks like blood running down her eye? That's an evocative image to use in the very first clip that players will see. Even with the slow but oddly fluid in-game character animations and fixed camera angles, Parasite Eve uses tricks like tilting the perspective with a Dutch angle to make the player feel just that teensy bit more uncomfortable, or it'll remind you how empty New York now is with a beautiful but solemn shot of the city's skylines. Other times, it goes further beyond the norm for the sake of immersion, with mirrors reflecting Aya's movements in real time or echoing footsteps in a long, empty hallway, adding the sound of glass crunching under Aya's boots in some contextual areas. All of this is stuff that not many games were attempting at the time, even fewer were attempting them well, and certainly no other role-playing games even dared to go this far. Even the ladder climbing had purpose. Of course, with the cinematics, that top-of-the-line square budget certainly helped there. But on the other side, for whatever reason, the development team chose to exclude voice acting entirely from this supposedly cinematic experience, despite fellow 1998 Square game Brave Fencer Musashi having both English and Japanese dubs. And yet it's this decision, it's Parasite Eve's lack of voice acting that might help the game hold up as much as it does, since I don't even have to reference Resident Evil to talk about how awful the voice work was in a ton of 90s games. The only sound design we get to work with beyond your usual video game sounds are those contextual footstep effects and the amazing soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura, occasionally punctuated by complete silence. Shimamura had previously worked on massive hits such as Street Fighter 2 and Super Mario RPG, but it's Parasite Eve that she considered her most challenging work yet. On top of visiting the US for inspiration, she aimed to create a catchy but also harrowing score that combined the completely dissonant sounds of operas and the electronic music that you might hear when walking through a late 90s New York City street while capturing the unsettling undercurrents of the game's thriller plotlines and she got to do it for the first time on a CD-based system which allowed her even more freedom. The challenge she made to herself absolutely paid off. I'm not usually somebody who listens to video game music outside of, you know, video games, but I've been coming back to some of these songs time and again ever since I played it. I mean, that NYPD theme? Absolute banger. And the NYPD is exactly where we're headed next in our story, after a brief detour back to the museum laboratory, where Maida puts together that Aya's mitochondria are in fact special before Dr. Clamp discovers them trespassing and chases them off. And just as you're already expecting that Clamp is involved in the evil plot, you're probably also expecting the NYPD office to be under attack by mitochondrial monsters, and you'd be right on the money. I will say I expected the whole your character's safe zone ends up being a dangerous place trope to pop up a little bit later than only two to three hours into the story, but I wasn't kidding, Parasite Eve wastes no time. As predictable as this section may have been going into it though, I really love how it played with the tension. We get to see several cutscenes showing that Aya's always just a few steps behind little Ben as he follows the police dog that's well on its way to transforming into a man-eating monster. And it keeps you wondering if Square would actually pull the trigger on a dog eating a child. Surely they wouldn't, right? 
in the end, no, no, they don't do that. Aya arrives just in time to save Ben, with the police captain sustaining serious injuries while trying to hold the now Cerberus dog off. With Captain Baker out of commission, Daniel takes over as acting captain, and the next day, Aya heads to St. Francis Hospital to try and stop Eve from using the sperm bank to create the ultimate life form. Most of Day 4's story beats are fuzzy flashbacks of a young Aya in the same hospital years prior for some sort of surgery, and visions of Aya's deceased twin sister, and no, I'm not kidding here, Maya. Aya and Maya. <laughs> you can't make that up. Bookending this hospital visit is a conversation with Maido where he gives you one of the many good luck charms that just eat up inventory space and don't do anything at all. It's just, it's just kind of his thing. He likes giving Aya gifts for some reason. And the worst section in the entire game. At this point in the story, the military's been called in to start trying to contain the EVE situation, which naturally means flying fighter jets through the city at street level. What are you doing? Immediately after a boss fight against the giant spider thing, Eve crashes two of these jets together, leaving you rushing around the rooftop trying to find a way to escape before the jet crashes right onto the building and kills you. At first you would think it's the big, gigantic hole that the boss just fell through, but nope. Then you'd assume that maybe it's the stairwell right to the north of that giant hole, but again, nope. If you're like me, you might not notice the lift tucked away in the bottom left corner of the building, and that means that you'll die and have to restart from the save right before the boss fight, except the save room is also an encounter room. And if you remember what I said earlier, you'll know that that means that you're more or less guaranteed to get into a fight the moment you reload your save. This is one of the few sections in the game that I would call outright poorly designed. I could almost accept the instant death for not finding the exit quickly enough. I mean, I don't agree with it, but hey, it was only my first death, and maybe they couldn't set up a save option right after the fight. I'm not too upset about it. But then there's the unskippable post-boss cutscenes that lead to the jet section, and the cheap shot of the pre-boss fight fight, and the fact that there's a section later in the game that pops up a save prompt after a bunch of cutscenes, meaning that that would have been definitely possible here. Either way, if this is the worst the game's had to offer so far besides... ...then that's actually not that bad at all. Day 5, though, is the longest and sometimes sloggiest in the entire game, mainly due to a protracted, visually samey, and somewhat aimless sewer dungeon. After making her way from the sewers to a subway tunnel to somehow the Brooklyn Bridge, Aya realizes that the mitochondrial goo is propagating near the museum, which... Y yeah, I, I could have told you that. How was that a surprise? The ensuing museum dungeon is a bit on the longer side, but still incredibly fun, at least until you get lost and start backtracking. The dungeons really could have used some maps now that I'm thinking about it. From fights with escaped, mutated armadillos, to fighting mitochondrially revived pterodactyls, because sure, that makes sense, to back-to-back -back fights with a triceratops, and then a T-Rex, because of course, why not? It really brings a final dungeon feel to a familiar area that we've only briefly visited a few times by this point. And while, like I said earlier, I doubt the map is actually lined up with the real thing, many of the different exhibits are, or at least have been, featured in the real Museum of Natural History, which I really appreciate. I can only imagine the light bulb that went off in some staffer's head when they saw the giant T-Rex displayed in the center atrium. Just before ensuring that the dinosaurs go extinct a second time, Aya meets up with Daniel and Maida in Dr. Clamp's office, and finds that the scientist has engineered a custom sperm, the real top shelf stuff, so that Eve can give birth to the ultimate being without risk of it exploding like the first time in Japan. Clamp then shows up and rants and raves for a bit about how humans are inferior creatures, and then has Eve set him on fire to try and kill our heroes, but apparently he didn't get the memo that Aya is fireproof? It's at this point that Aya kills the dinosaurs and prepares the final assault on the now pregnant Eve. Or rather, that's the plan, but Eve is rescued by the mitochondrial goo and Aya joins the navy. Uh, well, temporarily. Get ready for the return of Plot Dump City, as at this point we're treated to 20 continuous minutes of cutscenes and dialogue, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Maida reveals that before Clamp's office was destroyed in the explosive Clamp fire thing, he discovered that the drugs that Melissa was taking were immunosuppressants, as she'd received a donated kidney. Sound familiar? When Aya was young, her twin sister Maya and her mother had a fatal car accident, and remember that Aya's mom is meant to be the same woman that received a kidney years prior from the very first Eve. While their mother's organs weren't recoverable, Maya's were, leading to Eve's mitochondria spreading to another person and setting the ball in motion for the Carnegie Hall incident decades later. And wouldn't you know it, Clamp happened to be a medical intern working at the hospital during that very transplant, and he'd later become a willing pawn in Eve's plan. Two years after that, Aya received a cornea transplant to correct some sort of impaired vision she'd had as a child. 
The donor cornea was her sister's, preserved for the previous two years, and Maya's advanced mitochondria then began propagating within and working symbiotically with Aya's body rather than acting as a parasite as they had with both Eves. This is what would lead to Aya's immunity, and this is where the Navy comes in. Yeah, remember that? Since the military hadn't been able to even get close to Eve after more than a couple attempts, they put together that the only possible way to succeed is, and I'm not joking here, for Aya to fly in with a helicopter and drop a nuke on the giant goo creature after sending a dozen soldiers to their certain death just as distractions. This game, it, it's, it's just something else. Aya is able to take out the mitochondria, destroying the Statue of Liberty in the process, and then she lands on the demolished Liberty Island to take Eve down, once and for all. Mercifully, the game allows you to save after this massive string of cinematics right before the final fight with Eve, although if you're underprepared, it would be very easy to accidentally softlock yourself here. The Eve fight can be pretty challenging, unless you choose to use the new Liberate spell that you unlocked not long before this, as that'll essentially wipe her out in about three hits. And this is how day five of this nightmare week ends, with Eve perishing before she can give birth to the ultimate being, and with the world saved once and for all. Oh, f***. Yeah, you might remember that I mentioned this was a six-day adventure at the start of the retrospective. This is probably the most horror game part of the entire game, really, a section that makes you feel like you're winding down, letting you soak in the victory on the Navy's aircraft carrier, before suddenly the remaining mitochondrial goo gives birth to a flying demon baby. Hideo Kojima, eat your heart out. This massive four-phase fight is naturally the biggest challenge in the game, as the baby grows up from a baby to an all-powerful adult right in front of you. Thankfully, you're given a bunch of items to help replenish your stock after the fight with Eve, because if not, I, I don't know how this fight would have been possible. Maida also tries to give Ayo one final trinket before this fight, but Daniel pulls him away and tells him to stop screwing around. This fight with the demon baby is brutal. If you don't know the exact attack patterns of each of the ultimate being's phases, you can get wiped out in just one or two hits. Even as a weak baby, this thing has an AoE attack that's guaranteed to bring you down to one HP if it hits. At one point, I got stunlocked by its final form's floating drone things while in mid-reload and had to restart the entire fight from the beginning. Another few times, I got smacked around by the third form. If you're not intentionally overleveled, it's gonna take you a few tries to figure out which areas are safe during attacks, and when you should just run and pray that you don't get wiped. The Liberate spell I mentioned earlier is gonna be your best friend here once you get to Phase 3, but since it leaves you stunned for a few seconds afterwards, you have to make sure that the risk is worth the reward. But that final form, whew, man, you only deal one damage per shot for the first several times you attack because no bullets are effective against it. No bullets, except for the ones Maida had made using samples of Aya's blood, that trinket that he was going to give her earlier. Realizing that the world could be doomed because he was impatient and Maida couldn't just say, hey, use these bullets instead of stammering nervously around a pretty girl, Daniel grabs the special magazine, jumps out of the helicopter, and throws it to Aya while his mitochondria set him on fire. <laughs> Alright, I take back anything bad I said about this game. That is the best thing I've ever seen. With just a few shots of these enhanced blood bullets, the ultimate being is defeated once and for all. Except, you know, like any horror monster, no, no, it's not once and for all just yet. So Aya runs through the ship's corridors, preparing to blow the entire aircraft carrier up just to kill this thing, all while the ultimate being quickly chases behind her. If you make a single wrong move during this section, or if you're just not fast enough and this thing catches up to you, it's instantly game over, and it's all the way back to the start of Baby Phase 1. I did say Day 6 was the closest to an actual horror game, and there's nothing scarier than an instant death section. But with one final explosion, the mitochondria monster is defeated, Aya just caused over $10 billion in damage, and Parasite Eve is finished. We end with a really funny piece of wrap-up that revisits the exact same opera show at Carnegie Hall, with Aya, Daniel, who by the way survived getting set entirely on fire from the inside out, I guess ocean water helps that? I don't know. And Maida literally on the edge of their seats, afraid that everybody is going to explode during this show again. After that, our journey is over, closing out with Aya seemingly activating her mitochondria to protect everybody else in Carnegie Hall, just in case another Eve was there about to try anything. I walked away from my time with Parasite Eve overwhelmingly impressed. Now, obviously it's a PS1 game, it's got some dated mechanics and some problems that I can nitpick, such as unskippable cutscenes right before a boss fight, but after a save point. 
But so many of those issues are expected by now, just as expected as some occasionally awkward early CG cutscenes or weird character models. Even on those fronts, Parasite Eve pushed well past what I would expect from a 1998 PlayStation game. It really does live up to Square's marketing that this was the studio's first cinematic RPG. In a genre so often filled with bloat and, well, filler, Parasite Eve gets in and gets out without wasting your time, and it tells a really fun and interesting story in the process. It ended up leaving me wanting just a little bit more, without feeling like it was an unfinished or partial game, and that's exactly what you want. You want to leave your audiences wanting more. I wanted to see this unique battle system explored more. I wanted to see more of the creative enemy designs, maybe a couple more dungeons. Even as the pace maybe bloats out a little bit during days 4 and 5, I was still having a blast playing it pretty much the entire time. But for those that might still want some more, I've got good news. The game has a full, enhanced New Game Plus mode. Right before the end of the game, you can custom engrave one weapon and one armor piece, which will carry those items over into your next playthrough if you decide to play New Game Plus. So while you will start over from level 1, you'll also be one-shotting just about every enemy for the first several hours. New Game Plus also adds a sort of procedurally generated randomized super dungeon, the 77th floor epic that is Chrysler Tower. I tried this out and I admittedly didn't get very far since I was still pretty low level on the new playthrough, but it's exactly what a lot of people looking for more out of Parasite Eve would want. It even features another final boss and a true ending, but I'll leave all of that a surprise for those of you that want to play it yourself. Given how unique, and more importantly, how enjoyable Parasite Eve is, you would have to think that it spawned at least a mildly successful series of games, and you'd be… sort of right. But I'll say right now that if you find you're a huge fan of Parasite Eve's battle system while you're playing through it, I definitely suggest keeping Chrysler Tower in mind, because although Parasite Eve does have two sequels, neither of them are cut from the same cloth as this one. This is where those two dirty words that have gotten me a bunch of hate comments already, I guarantee it. This is where that specter hanging over Parasite Eve's head comes back into play. Resident Evil. Parasite Eve 2 released in 1999 in Japan and 2000 in the West, about two years after the first game in each region. And while the first game isn't really all that comparable to Biohazard, this sequel certainly is. I'm talking classic survival horror gameplay, tank controls, much of the first game's plot is just kind of forgotten or ignored in pursuit of a higher octane story featuring many classic Resident Evil tropes, the whole nine yards. It still has some light RPG elements, and it retains a couple ties back to the first game, but Square nudged Parasite Eve 2 in a very clearly Resident Evil-inspired direction, using a new development team that poached the first Resident Evil's writer-slash-director to write and head this project, along with several other developers from Capcom. Despite all these changes, critics were still fond of Parasite Eve 2, although by the time it released, we'd already seen Resident Evil evolve a bit through its first three games, so more than a few of this game's mechanics seemed a bit behind the times even back then. Whether this genre shift is your thing or not is entirely up to your preferences. For many of you, you probably love classic Resident Evil, and that's why you're even watching this video, so Parasite Eve 2 might be a blast. For me though, tank controls are kind of my one gaming non-starter. No matter how many times I've tried, I've just never been able to sink myself into a game with that style. I did play a bit of 2 for the sake of showcasing some of those differences, and then I turned it off. Maybe one day I'll go back to it, who knows. From what I've seen, the Parasite Eve fanbase seems pretty split about which one between 1 and 2 they prefer, but I think 1 probably takes the cake. Either way, in Parasite Eve 2's defense, it apparently started development as a spin-off game featuring a new character Kyle as the protagonist, that's why it was a completely different genre. But then Aya was shoehorned in and Kyle became the love interest character. Whatever the reasons may be, it's a shame we never got to see another game quite like the original Parasite Eve. There's a lot of room left where that original style could have grown. Now what I just said might have some of you asking, wait, you said there were two sequels, right? It's, it's kind of my understanding that we don't usually talk about the third game, or rather, the third birthday. That's, that, that, that's the name. Parasite Eve 3, released in late 2010 on the PSP, is not called Parasite Eve 3, the name is actually just The Third Birthday. No subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but if I were going to release a new game in a series that I've left dormant for over a decade, maybe I would include the original series name somewhere in there? Like, could you imagine if Half-Life 3 was just called The Office Christmas Party? <laughs> 
Depending on who you ask, this game is a sequel to Parasite Eve 2, or it's a spin-off, or it's a reboot that never got off the ground. It's not really all that clear as far as I understand. Whatever you want to call it though, the game was designed to be very, very loosely connected to the previous two games at the very best, so it may as well be a reboot. And since this series is going to keep genre shifting for some reason, it's now a mission-based third-person shooter action game thing with some RPG elements thrown in. You can kind of think of the third birthday like the Crisis Core of Parasite Eve, except that unlike Final Fantasy VII, we haven't gotten a Parasite Eve remake yet. And also, Crisis Core doesn't have a gameplay mechanic where the main character's clothes rip off the more damage he takes, because... <sighs> yeah, that's a thing here. Now let me make it clear that I haven't played more than about 10% of the third birthday yet either. Again, this retrospective is only supposed to be about the first game, I'm just mentioning these out of obligation at this point because motherfucker we've made it this far, we may as well mention the whole series. From a pure presentation standpoint, the game does look great by PSP standards, and if I completely looked past the gross clothes ripping mechanic and what sounds and seems like a nonsensical story that just, just totally assassinates Aya's character featuring time travel shenanigans and giant angry trees? What? If I look past all of that, the gameplay actually is pretty neat. But yet again, the original Parasite Eve's unique approach has yet to be properly followed up on. It makes Parasite Eve 1 a bit tough to recommend in a way, because there's not going to be a huge number of players that genuinely love all three games if you were to start today. You'll be lucky to even check off two of the three, honestly. They're just all so different. Of course, I still do recommend this game. I'm not in the habit of spending dozens of hours playing a game and then a hundred hours or more producing a retrospective just to say, yeah, it's okay. Having only played it for the first time for this video, I loved Parasite Eve. I think it's got a valuable place in gaming's history as part of the medium's transition into a more cinematic style. And I think that despite that early cinematic approach, it somehow missed so many of the pitfalls that many of its contemporaries stumbled into. The game holds up remarkably well, even today. This is more of a solemn reminder that if you're like me and you fall in love with Parasite Eve's storytelling approach, or its surprisingly fleshed out cast of characters, or its customizable gameplay, or really anything about it besides a character named Aya and some monsters, you're risking disappointment the further you look past just this one game. But rather than end on a bit of a downer, let's look another 10 years past the third birthday and let's get maybe a little bit hopeful or optimistic for the future. In 2020, after another decade of silence regarding Parasite Eve, famed Square Enix producer Yoshinori Kitase said that it would be a waste not to explore the Parasite Eve franchise and characters such as Aya in an interview with pro wrestler Kenny Omega of all people. Apparently the cleaner was the only person in the past decade that's thought to ask about Parasite Eve, so... Good job, game journalists. Katase did also mention that he didn't know about any plans currently in the works, so at the end of the day, that's just one guy saying that he would like to say more, one guy that happens to be near the top of the food chain at the company. In an era of revived interest in survival horror games, a period where Resident Evil has seen several strong remakes and reimaginings, and where Square Enix's own Final Fantasy VII Remake is not only actually a thing that's actually out and actually in our hands after actually 30 years of development, but it also has a strong case for many to be 2020's Game of the Year, myself included. The door is cracked open ever so slightly for a Parasite Eve revival. Thanks to the whole book licensing thing, I don't know that it would or could even be called Parasite Eve though, or whether a modern remake or reimagining is even viable. I wouldn't be surprised if that's part of why The Third Birthday has the horrible name that it does because they couldn't get the rights back to Parasite Eve maybe. Whatever the case may be behind the scenes, or whether Katase was just being polite and political, for now I'm gonna choose to be optimistic that maybe one day we might see another crack at the one-of-a-kind game that is Parasite Eve. Thank you so, 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 so much for watching, especially if you've made it all the way through to this point. I really do appreciate it. If you've made it this far, I think I can assume you enjoyed the nostalgia trip or experiencing this game for the first time today, so I'd like to ask you to share that enjoyment by sharing this video with your friends, communities, or somewhere on the internet, because it really, truly does help me out. And if you've got a game in mind that you'd love to see me cover in a future retrospective, please make sure to let me know in the comments, or on Twitter, or at the grocery store, wherever you might find me. I've had a blast exploring Parasite E for the first time, and it's genuinely thanks to one very kind viewer just like you who put the game on my radar. 
If you haven't gotten enough of my voice already somehow, and you'd like to watch another of my videos right now, I highly recommend my gargantuan Legend of Dragoon retrospective, or my documentary videos on Metroid Other M or PlayStation All-Stars, exploring those two games' development history and looking at why they failed. Or if you're, I don't know, sane, you can just subscribe and watch those another day, with the added bonus of keeping up to date with all of my new projects right as they release. Thanks again so much, truly, and as always, until next time, stay golden. Lastly, I'd like to thank my Patreon producers for their incredible support, with a special shout out to Goldstorm07, James Boss, Terminally Nerdy, Wolf Chaoson, and Buckles Chucklo. Without the support of viewers and patrons just like you, videos of this scope simply wouldn't be possible. Their support truly does mean the world, and if you'd like to contribute and unlock some exclusive perks, you can do so at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.